I've just completed this little sketch in pencil and then watercolour of Autrois here in this beautiful part of France. I started by drawing the main shapes with this tower, gauging the proportions to this tower, and then drawing very faintly before I was able to overdraw with a stronger pencil. Um, second stage, very simply just working in blocks from the distance forward. I'm going to explain the whole process if you follow the video from the first principles and hopefully explaining um, what looks like quite a complicated perspective in a, a simple enough manner um, so you can paint the same. So now I've got the basic, the basic shape so I can start drawing the individual parts. One tip I think helps a lot of artists who find perspective is a little complicated is to, to have something to compare everything to. So when you start any building, I always think the simplest advice, the simplest thing is to use a main vertical. It might be the nearest vertical in the building. But if you can use one part of a building to gauge everything else in your drawing from that will guarantee you get keep to a fixed scale so you can for example take the top this little side turret and you can count it into everything else to, to check the scale some artists say to me they just go by eye and that's that's great it, it may may work out but when it doesn't look right, you need to be able to work out why to put it right. And if you aren't sure, having that first first mark to work off is, is the best way of making sure everything else follows on. Actually, interesting, I've made that chimney a bit too big. I'm going to just reduce it down. Clean that up before we paint. Another simple tip is when you're drawing, looking up at a building, in this instance you've got these conical towers, so you'll always be looking up. And if you're looking up at something that is circular, The middle, the middle of this instance is part of the roof will be the highest point. So you have to draw a curve going up. If you're looking down, you have shorter plants. So I've got the main tower taking shape. Now.
So whenever I'm gauging the angle of any line, I'm, I'm judging the sky whether those lines are going to the high or low angle. One anomaly of drawing perspective in a situation like this is I'm actually looking downhill, yet my lines are going up. Okay, I suppose I could go into a lecture on why that is, but um, don't be put off by that. Just keep judging whether they look, you know, what angle they make, that they look right, and your perspective will, I promise you, it will resolve itself. So one thing that is quite tricky though, is drawing an arch at an angle. So I'm going to just explain that in a second. I'm just plotting the base, the of the arch, the width of it. I'm starting off just by drawing a rectangle, but a rectangle at an angle that will enclose the arch. then work out at what point the arch starts arching. I'll make two arcs on left and right. And to accurately work out, I'll do this with another pencil. Center of this arch is discovered by doing diagonal lines from corner to corner because the centre of this arch is not halfway between the left and the right. The simple reason is the right hand half of the arch is closer to it. So having marked these diagonals, I can also use them to plot the curve of the arch by making the diagonals. I put little dots on them. You need to keep checking though, every time you do a window you really need to check you know, what the angles are, particularly of the lintel and the ledge, because that's the tricky bit. You can normally rely on verticals to stay vertical, not always, but normally. But again, you can just hold your pencil out, gauge the angle, and you can get pretty close. Without getting all the windows in the tower. Very beautiful ornate door here with a unusual shape into the top. So let's see if you can get a way of doing that. Again I'm going to start with a rectangle. Right, I've been sketching this beautiful little medieval street scene, um, focusing on this, this tower with most unusual shapes to it. But I've used the proportions of this tower to gauge all the other shapes, buildings to the right, buildings to the left. And what's unusual about this is I'm looking down this street, despite the lines going up. I'm looking up to the top of the tower and then there are cliffs beyond. So there's a lot of perspective, but what I'm trying to do is keep it really simple 
And the way I've looked at the perspective is I've not used any vanishing points. What I'm doing is I'm just gauging all the angles relative to a horizontal or a vertical. So I'm using my pencil, holding it out, checking the angles relative to the horizontal, relative to the vertical. So if you're stuck with perspective, just, just do the same. Hold your pencil out, look at the angle. And in fact, sometimes you can even hold your artwork right next to the roof or the top of a tower or whatever it is and just gauge those angles that's the trickiest thing to get right but if you can just literally take the angle transpose it put it onto your picture you can do something like this without vanishing points you, you've got to check proportions so once you've got the first building in place you can then measure its width, width and gauge the rest to that you can measure its height relative to its width and gauge everything else relative to that. So you can get everything proportionate by using one key part of the picture as your, as your gauge. So if you're doing any street scene, just use one building to start with. Maybe it's one in the center, maybe one to the side, but a building that you can then use a, as a reference to compare everything else with. And hopefully you can get it all sketched. So if you want to watch the next stage, I'm going to put some paint on this uh, little sketch and get some colour down. Scene, I'm going to start with the traditional sky wash. I'm just using a Chinese sui brush it's called, which have got fantastic water retention properties. They hold a lot of water for their size. And I've got a quite a rough paper here, so my concern with the rough paper is if you don't get the water into the entire surface of the paper you'll get a broken bit of paint or broken color so I'm now just taking some ultramarine blue and some tharlo blue the two blues together to give a gentle bit of blue sky there is blue above me you may not see it in the video there's a bit of cloud lower cloud but there is blue above me and there was some blue cloud when I was some blue sky when I was sketching so I'm bringing that blue down a bit lower done as that starts to dry I'm just watching the drying time taking off the little bits of uh, where I've rubbed things out earlier I'm just watching the drying time because I'm going to paint the top of the cliff into the damp edge of that sky don't want any I don't want any drips coming through I just want it damp so I'm just running along there with the tissue to take out any areas where the water's collected but now I can go straight into the skyline and there's a mixture of colors there but I want to keep the colors pretty soft pretty pale so I'm just um, testing on my tissue here And by painting into the, the, that line of the sky, what happens is the tree line themselves, they just softly merge. And what I, as I paint, I actually change the colors as I go along. So I've started with a little bit of green there. I've added a little bit more blue here. And then I'm going to convert to some paler colors in a minute where the, the cliffs to the right are catching the Sun. I haven't wet these areas, I'm just working dry and by moving the brush quickly I can exploit the texture of the, of the trees on the side of the cliff. I can leave paper showing which I'll come back to with other paler colours. And the trick when you're painting on to dry is to gauge the amount of water on your brush and to use the pressure of the brush to control whether you fill the grain of the paper or whether you leave some of the paper showing. So the pressure, more pressure, you'll fill it in, less pressure, you'll 
achieve what, what's called a scumble, where you've got these broken colours. So I'm now cleaning my brush in my palette. Going to change colours. And I'm going to start painting the sort of pinky greys of the cliff here. And they're first going to put, this is very pale cadmium red. It's very, very delicate and pale. I'm now adding a little bit of yellow to it. You've got these sort of orangey rocks showing through, sort of mellow orange colour, very beautiful. Just trying to suggest them. I'm not painting any particular shapes here, just using random strokes and broken strokes. I'm going to chase that colour with a little bit of grey. Traditional recipe of ultramarine and burnt umber. The burnt umber and the ultramarine together balanced will produce a whole range of greys and it's now down to the quantity of water I use as to the depth of the greys in question and I'm going to just dot these in and these represent the little shadows between some of the rocks and I'm catching the edge of some colours damp we get a soft edge and other areas where I've got dry paper I get a nice sharp line. So I'm getting the variety of textures just by using dry and then wet patches. I'm aiming for the edge of a colour if I want a soft edge or for a, the middle of the space if I want a dry edge. And then I can suggest all the different textures you see in the, in the cliff. It goes a bit darker up here, so now it's started to dry. I can strengthen the colours from earlier. The sky's still got some moisture in it, so I'm still getting some soft edges to my tree line, which works. You don't have to paint any twigs or branches. The, the, the water will just create that effect. Just a smudge with a finger there to stop it spreading. So I'll come back to those gaps and put colour in there later with a paler colour. I need it to be dry for that otherwise it will run out of control so I'll just let those shapes dry as they are. Um, there's a little shadow across this meadow I'm just going to put that in before that totally dries and then we can paint the, the buildings. So to start with I'm going to go for the palest colours I'm changing over from the Chinese brush now to a flat brush and the idea is to paint the um, all the mellow colours of the stonework. So I'm taking a flat brush and I've got some, um, it's actually gamboge which is a beautifully luminous yellow colour. I'm adding cadmium red to it. And I'm now going to dilute it. <coughs> I need to put some more water. I'll put some more water here. Dilute it down to get this mellow orangey yellow colour, which I can literally put right over the building again onto dry. And what I'm doing is just again just deciding how much water to put into the brush as to how much I want the, the colour to fill in the grain and how much to leave some of the grain showing. And I'm not worried yet about the light shadow contrast because I'm going to put several layers of paint on. The windows don't need to be picked out yet. They're darker, so I can do those with um, shadows later on. I'm just slightly changing the colour as I come forward. I'm just adding a little bit more yellow to the building on the right. Just seems to be catching a bit more yellow in the light here. So I'm putting some yellow into that. And it's all on to dry. No, no wet on wet here. This is all just painting straight on to dry colours. When you've got the colour that works, 
I find that it pays to look for that colour everywhere in your painting and literally it's like painted by numbers. I just paint all the yellow areas, all the orange areas and progress and it sounds simple and it probably is simple. So I think I've got all the, the first layer of colour in. I'm now watching to see what areas I need to work wet into wet, but I'm adding a bit of ultramarine to that first mixture because this tower on the right of it has got some greyer areas, so that is just a question of ultramarine. And I want to get, there's a soft graduation, this is a modelling shadow basically going around here, there's a soft graduation as the mellow colour graduates into this darker shadow. So. The trick here is not to keep going on with this brush. I'm now going to get a second brush. This is an aquash brush which has water in the barrel. The trick here is to take this brush and just run it down the middle before that shadow dries. So now I've got a soft graduation. So I can go back to my square brush, do the same on the right of this tower, or this part of the tower. And again, if the first colour has dried, I'll just take my, it's what I call a control brush. I always like to have a brush with no colour on it. I can just make it wet or slightly wet and then I can control the colours I've already put down. I can also use it for just water, for the softening colours. If I feel the colour I put on is too strong, I can grab the control brush and just dilute what's already on the paper. So I'm now going to run through with my ultramarine, adding a bit more here and there adding a bit less in odd places but let's get the shadow on this tower again there's a shadow coming from underneath the edge of the roof so I'm gonna put that in control brush it will merge that shadow into the rest so again I'm just looking for wherever I see the same the same color And, and apply and don't be in a hurry to fill in all the colors you see at this point what you can do is leave a few gaps because you can always go back and it might be you want to have a few highlights for different colored stones or it might be that you want to um, vary the color with another another tint so don't think you've got to put your your colour over the whole wall. It is typically in, in architecture of this type it is handy to to leave some gaps. So I've done that here and so for example I'm just going to go back to my original warm colours and patchwork of colours add it to what I was just putting in so that's reduced that shadow from a darker shadow like here to slightly softer. There's a shadow underneath the overhang here and because the overhang has got a Roman tiled roof, what I'm doing is with the corner of my flat brush, I'm trying to show the rippling of that shadow cast onto the wall. I can do the same thing underneath the, the Roman tiles here by putting the corner of the brush right up into the, under the underside of where the tiles are going to be capture that and I can do the same at the edge of the roof here. Lots of just little dots of shadow. This is again the ultramarine just mixed in with the orangey yellow and then those dots get bigger and bigger as they come towards me. So you can suggest detail. It's not a very small brush is it? This is a 5-8 flat, flat brush but you can suggest these small details with a good quality brush like this. This is a sable mixture brush but it means that I can get a lot of detail very quickly because the brush holds lots more paint than a detail brush plus I can keep going you know right to the end of the wall here and I've got enough paint to, to carry on. 
with the rest of it. Right, so we've got some of the colours in here. There's more me, I need some colour in it. And I, I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to start with quite a strong colour, mixing in with the first colour, and then I'm going to soften that by going back into the into the orange. I'm probably exaggerating the, the warmth of the colour in this wall, but I think it's in shadow. I want to get this contrast running across the subject. And also by putting this wall into shadow or into more shadow, the eye will be taken to the light that's catching the main tower. It's always tricky when you're painting out of doors as the sun goes in and out to see where your shadows go. So you have to, don't carry on painting when the sun's gone down um, or you've lost the sun. If you want to get the shadows right, wait for the sun to come back, then you can get the shape of the shadows as you need them. But what I can do in the meantime is draw in the other features. So for example, this edge of this roof is dark and I just put some more arch marine into my mix. Dry edge there. I'm now going to add a little bit of that orangey red, a tiny bit more water, and get that to flow more into the grain of the paper. I can now put some other colours into this wall, which is darker, and I can put a whole lot of colour on this wall. I'm starting off with just patches of grey and I'm going to darken it and darken it and put some green in there too. You've got sort of mossy growth on it. And again, you can exploit the shadows. But I, these are, shadows are an opportunity really to so have a bit of fun with colour. So I've got a bit of a purple thing going on here, blues and a little bit of a browny red. A bit of space here because I'm now going to introduce the green that um, we've got where the, where the wall has got some, some mossy, um, mossy growth plus uh, there's dandelions on the top of it. Anyway, I'm just trying to get the right green here. I've got two brighter green, so I'm just adding a little bit of red to it. Red is opposite to green. That has just taken that red, the red has just taken that green down into a more shadowy green. Again, just following the gaps down the wall here. And often if I'm painting an area like this and it's all one green, I'm thinking, no, there's more than one green. So I stop, clean the brush out a bit. I'm grabbing some yellow. And then I can chase that green with a bit of yellow to bring it to life. So this is a bit of lemon yellow. Just catches some of that green. But what we've got now is some of the darker green I started with, but I've added a bit of yellow. And we can do the same for the weeds at the bottom of the wall. And you can do it both ways around. So you can start with the pale colour, add the dark, or you can do it. There's no, there are rules that people seem to apply to painting like this but to be honest if it works it's good don't worry too much about you know whether you should do it light to dark dark to dark to light if it works that's what counts and the way you'll find out if it works is sometimes you you know sometimes you get it wrong but that's that's good if you never get anything wrong you're never learning so again I've started here I put the light in first and now I chase it with the dark and that way we get a bit of shrub which is modelled with a few shadows. And this sort of technique is all again down to timing, watching the colours, catching the light edge and so on. So we've got a lot of the um, colours in the building. I could go back and add a bit of variety in stonework, but what I'm going to do to, to get this painting moving quickly is the street and the rooftops. So let's start with the street. Very pale grey where the sun's on the road. So here, very pale grey. I've just mixed it out of the other colours, so it's gone a little bit green. I'm just going to adjust my grey with a bit more blue. Yeah. 
and I'm going to paint the whole road just sucking it back a bit I didn't want it too dark so again don't worry if the color comes out a bit strong just if you've got some tissue there you can suck it off I'm just adding more water to this gray now I'll let that dry off a bit and then I'm going to add shadow to it. When the sun's out, it, I've actually already mapped where I want the shadow, but I'm going to put a darker shade on top of this part. And whilst that's drying, I can go and put the rooftops in place. And they're all beautiful tiles, but mostly in shadow, except for here we've got the more orangey tiles. the pinky orange adding a tiny bit more red so we start with the palest color again you can work straight on to dry leave some gaps where the light catches the tiles I can go back in with some deeper shades for individual tiles later. Now the rest of the rooftops are darker, so I can start with my orangey colour, but I'm going to add a little bit of, just a bit of burnt umber to that colour. So we've got a sort of terracotta red, a little bit of brown coming in as well. Same here, I'm going to just flat brush, no, straight onto dry, and the trick here again is just to work the brush really quickly so it will leave a few little patches of different colours. And I will enhance that in a second by putting a few more sort of colours into it, like so. Just using the flat edge of the brush to create the sort of suggestion of tiles. And again, catching the, the, pa the paper when it's still damp. Do a bit more color on this roof too. I need my control brush just graduate that colour into the rest of it, like so. Just keep it handy. A little bit of tiling on top of this chimney. The same with these rooftops, just simple block of colour. It's, ca well, when the sun's on it, it just catches a bit of light. So what I'm gonna do, it's not quite there yet, is just take the control brush and graduate that colour into that light edge. It will just model that part of the roof. The sun's now come back. It's obviously been listening to me. And so the same with these roofs. Start off with a sort of pinky red mixture, a little bit more deeper. Add a little bit of the burnt umber. Put a bit more water on my brush. Get it to flow in and as it dries again I'll just see if it needs a little bit of extra colour here and there. And I will be adding small shadows underneath the overhang of each bit of roof. Just checking on the colours. There's a little shadow on the edge of this roof. Just put that in. Again, the corner of the brush is quite sufficient for doing these extra bits of shadow. And of course, you can use the square brush 
again I'm just going back to my blue brown mixture you can use a square brush just to paint a whole window in one stroke like this and here and again some of these windows are, are quite dark some are reflecting a bit of light so just look at your windows notice I can get the corner of this brush into some nice little angles to really capture the different um, details in the windows. If you want you can go back and scratch out you know the highlights for glazing bars and stuff like that but um, try and keep try and keep windows it's very difficult to, get to make windows simple but try to keep them as simple as possible um, this door is catching the light in the sun so I'm gonna dilute my brown back again see if this is paired enough I think it might be there so there's a bit of a cast shadow on it which I'll add but we've also got the gates which I can do with the same color and again flat brush the edge of your brush can do all the palings and railings and all the detail of a of a gate like this you don't need a tiddly little um, round brush you can normally get your flat brush to do all the work adding a bit more shadow into this wall chasing that with the wet control brush you can also use the control brush to add little sort of soft shades of contrasting stonework or I could do it with the corner of my flat brush but the nice thing about this this control brush is because it comes to such a sharp tip I can pick out what the um, I think it's the corbling it's called all these little shadows underneath the arch I can emphasize the windows with a little stroke here and there there's a shadow from this dormer I suppose the trick is just to try out different brushes and see which do the job but generally I try to use the biggest brush I can in order to cover the area quickly. A bit like the chimney, a bit of shadow on it, a bit more shadow underneath the roof, a bit more shadow under this bit of roof. colour underneath the overhang of the roof here too. And shadows going into these windows. We're actually just seeing the shadow on the stonework here. We don't see the windows, we just see the edges of the, the, the stones of the coins of the window which creates a shadow of going in. We've got a shadow underneath this arch. Quite a strong shadow all the way down. Shadow inside this door. Well, let's get some colour on this door. And I think other than working into um, a few more details of stonework, I've now got most of the building into place. 
I can also take some, ta um, some paler colours and just put it through my gaps in the cliff. Where I'm not seeing white, but I'm seeing little paler areas. So again, some broken strokes there, just link it all together. And I can paint my red door foreground which actually there's light on it so don't make it too dark yeah that's gonna dry nice and pale and when it as it dries I can then put the shadows into the details the paneling of the door um, now I can do the shadow on the ground and this is going to be an ultramarine with a bit of crimson in it but more blue than red here we go so a nice purple shadow falling down here and it actually goes across and earlier on it threw a shadow right up this wall. It's not so high now, but I've drawn it, so I'm going to copy my drawing. Adding a bit more water to it, get this colour across the rest of the street. I can add a bit of it to the wall as well. And I can make a deeper version of it with a little bit of brown in it, so sort of purpley brown to add a few extra darker shadows into this wall where the stonework is very rough. It just adds a bit of texture. I don't want to put too much detail in here, but I just want to set the scene with this. I can do the same on this wall, add a little bit more. Smudge it in a bit. any other shadows that need a bit of strength it's a great sort of way to link up the shadows through the whole painting shadow inside this little window I think it's back to my pack wash brush now for a few little details around my windows. I'm just chasing the sort of gaps to see what they need. Just a way of getting everything linking together. Again, some more orangey colours down here around my door and through the gate. Once the colour's dried, it means you can paint over it without worrying about it moving. And all it remains now is to do some little details with my flat brush to get a bit of variety into the stonework. So I'm just adding a hint of purple to my stone colours. And then we're going to be able to put some nice contrasting stones in the... Uh, in various walls um, surrounding this door try and when you're doing this you need to follow the perspective of your building and I know I'm using that word perspective here but you've already got your perspective established so just you know the shape of the windows the ledge so you can just follow those angles with your with your uh, flat brush and I'm just smudging some of these shapes out so that they're not too High contrast. I'm just going to dilute my colour down a little bit. So this is really down to personal choice how many of these 
colors you put in, how many stones you put in. Do the same here. You can just use the corner of the brush to do the smaller stones in the distance. And you can use the whole brush where you've got the bigger stone work. I think this roof just needs a little bit more dark on it, so I'm, I think this one is a bit too pale, so here I go, I'm just going to put a warmer sort of reddy brown on here, and I've added, this time I've added a little bit of my um, crimson to the red. It's not bright crimson, it's just enough to give some more interest to the roof colour. So again, just floating that over the top. I'm going to do the same on this turret, a little bit warmer, same on this turret. And this one. And I can do the same on the edges of a few of these, a few of these tiles. All just suggested without too much fuss, I hope. this edge just takes the line through just looking for any other details that might work but otherwise I think we are done